good morning, everyone. If you have your Bible, I want to invite you to turn with me to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, we're going to begin reading at the very end of Romans 9 and read into Romans chapter 10. I want to talk to you this morning about end your striving and begin thriving. End your striving and begin thriving. End of Romans 9 is where we'll begin. While you're finding your way there, just want to say thank you so much for your prayers. Thank you for your sacrificial giving towards phase two. Uh, might have noticed that the condition of the parking lot has improved a great deal since last week. Uh, we were able to get stripes put down and uh, get things cleaned up and put in order. Thank you for your patience. Um, thank you for just using extreme caution uh, while we finish up on our construction. We don't want anybody to get injured. We don't want any property damage. We did have an incident last week where someone damaged somebody's car, and, and we don't want that to happen. So uh, please just use extreme caution. Thank you for being patient. And uh, we're almost through. The parking lot is, is uh, almost in the final uh, state that it's going to be. So thank you. Last week we shared with you that our target date for completing the sanctuary is May 31st. We need to receive $800,000 in giving in order to complete the sanctuary and begin worshiping in it. So right now we're just asking you to prayerfully consider the best gift that you can make to help us reach that $800,000 goal. Uh, many people are still giving towards their jump-in pledges. We have actually exceeded by $50,000. We have exceeded the total amount that was pledged three years ago. Um, we were able to do that because there were some people who gave to the campaign, but they didn't have a pledge. Um, but some people are still working on their pledges. And so we're praying for you, and we're just asking you if you'd consider uh, making the best gift you can towards this $800,000 goal. Uh, if you're still giving towards a pledge, we'll count whatever you give towards that pledge that you've made. Um, next Sunday, weather permitting, we're going to take you all out into the new building. So uh, if you haven't been out to see the sanctuary yet, I want to tell you it's spectacular. Um, the basement is cavernous downstairs. Uh, we have some special things planned. So just pray with us that the weather will cooperate. We need it to be dry and uh, we need it to be kind of still. All is calm, all is bright. All right, that's how you can just pray. Lord, all is calm, all is bright next Sunday morning. And we're going to take a little walk together. And uh, so maybe that would be a week that you'd like to... Uh, bring something for the new building or Christmas weekend. We want to thanks, uh, give thanks to the Lord. We did receive a very significant gift this last week on Monday. And so praise God. Keep praying and, and we're getting there. All right, Romans chapter 9, beginning in verse 30. End your striving and begin thriving. Romans 9, beginning in verse 30. What shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it a righteousness that is by faith. But the people of Israel who pursued the law as a way of righteousness have not attained their goal. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, see, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. The one who believes in him. Who is him? Who is this stone? It's Jesus. It's Yeshua. The one who believes in him will never be put to shame. Looking at chapter 10, verse 1. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God is for the Israelites that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish a righteousness of their own, they didn't submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the culmination of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Moses writes about this righteousness that is by law. The person who does these things must live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. 
This is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. I want us to say the, these next words together because Romans 10.9 is one of the most famous verses in the scripture and it's one of the clearest verses that explain how it is that we become saved. Look at those words and read them with me. Romans 10.9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Let me read on. For it is with your heart you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess faith and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all, and he richly blesses all who call on him. How many of you know that's a good verse right there? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people you love so much. Thank you for your presence here and for your powerful word. Your word is truth. Father, I pray that we would encounter you today through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees with that, would you say amen and amen. I have a word from the Lord for somebody here this morning. The Lord says that the end of your striving is the beginning of your thriving. The end of your striving is the beginning of your thriving. For our summer vacation this year, we took a trip to Yellowstone National Park. It was the vacation of a lifetime. It was always my dad's dream to see the American West. He passed away last year before he ever got to go, but he left us a little money so we could go. And we're so glad that we did. Often when I travel, I find that I hear the Lord's voice a little bit more readily than when I'm home. There's just something about being away from the responsibilities and routines of your everyday life that maybe make it a little easier to hear from the Lord. The Lord sent Jeremiah down to the potter's house so he could talk to Jeremiah. This last year, I've had a lot on my mind. I've been thinking about my heart, my physical heart, uh, thinking about turning 50, thinking about the challenges of finishing phase two, thinking about the challenge of reaching millennials. And it just so happened that we booked a rafting trip on the Snake River in Grand Teton National Park. It was a, a wonderful day. It was spectacular scenery. It was a relaxing day. The best part is we really had to barely do anything at all. We were in a huge raft and it was just carried along very easily by the current. And we had a guide who was steering us with just one paddle and every once in a while he would say uh, to the people in the front, paddle right or paddle left, just to steer us around an obstacle. And while we were out on the river, the Lord spoke to me regarding harvest time. He said to me, Glenn, you don't have to propel harvest time. You don't have to push it forward. You don't have to generate forward momentum. He said, the current of my spirit will carry it forward. And he said, I will guide you. He said, all you have to do is listen and steer when and where I tell you. I have to tell you the truth. When the Lord spoke that word to me, such a burden lifted off of me immediately in that raft. Maybe that's why in July they told me that they didn't expect my heart to ever recover from congestive heart failure. They just hoped it wouldn't get any worse. In September, they told me, we don't understand, but your heart's 100%. How many of you know that there's a word in the book of Zechariah? God says it is not by might and it is not by power, but it is by my spirit. And beloved, listen to me. God's word to me on the Snake River is God's word to you this morning. It was a word for harvest time. When it comes to your life in Christ, you don't have to propel yourself forward. 
You don't have to generate forward momentum. You don't have to push yourself, promote yourself. You don't have to strive. The current of God's Holy Spirit inside of you will create forward momentum. And he will guide you. All you have to do is listen and steer when and where he tells you the end of your striving is the beginning of thriving. Somebody grab a hold of that word today and let it minister life to you. We started Romans 9 together just before Thanksgiving. In this chapter, Paul is explaining why the majority of Jewish people have not embraced the gospel and have not embraced Jesus, Yeshua, as their Messiah. Does that mean that God's promises to Israel have failed? Paul says, not at all. Because a remnant of Jews have believed. And God is not nearly finished with Israel yet. All Israel will be saved. In the last verses of chapter 9 and the opening verses of chapter 10, Paul uses the Jews and the Gentiles to show us how we can end our striving and begin thriving. As I look at Paul's words here, I see three steps that I want to share with you quickly this morning. End your striving and begin thriving. Three steps in Romans 9 and 10. The first step is this. If you want to end your striving and begin your thriving, avoid the ditch of religious self-righteousness. Avoid the ditch of religious self-righteousness. Paul uses the metaphor of a road race in these verses. We are all participants in this race of life. We are all headed for the finish line, the terminus, the culmination of our earthly existence and the commencement of our eternal existence. But in the middle of the road is a great big stone. His name is Jesus. And some of the racers stumble over this stone. Some try to avoid this stone. They try to steer clear of this stone. And in so doing, they steer right into a ditch of religious self-righteousness. And they get stuck there. Paul says this was the case of his own beloved Jewish people. And what applies to the Jewish people here applies to people of every religious stripe and affiliation, even Christian. Specifically in these verses, Paul is answering the question, why haven't the majority of Jewish people received Christ? And the answer is because their religion inadvertently got in the way. The Jewish people got caught up in the law of Moses in a way that was never intended. You see, the law was supposed to point them to their Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus. Yeshua is the goal of of the law. He's everything that the law was designed to add up to. He is the fulfillment of the law. He's the living embodiment of all the righteousness described in the law. He is the culmination of the law. He fully satisfied all the demands of the law, both by his sinless life and by his substitutionary death on the cross. Everything the law demanded, he fulfilled in his life and in his death. He's the only one who can deliver from bondage to the law. He's the only means by which any of us could ever keep the spirit of the law. Jesus said to the religious Pharisees, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. But he said, these are the very scriptures that speak of me. But you're not willing to come to me that you might have life. In Galatians, Paul says that the law was designed to be a guardian, a tutor, leading the Jewish people to Christ. Part of the law's job was to lead the Jewish people to see their own helplessness through the frustration of constantly failing to keep the law. The law was designed to help the Jewish people and all of us to see our need for a savior, our need for an atoning sacrifice. But instead of that, the Jewish people tried to use the law as a means of pleasing God. They tried to lift themselves up through their own efforts to keep the law. They tried to perfect themselves by redoubling their efforts to keep the law. Paul said they tried to establish a righteousness of their own making. 
a righteousness by keeping law. And because they understood the purpose of the law, they failed to recognize the one to whom the law pointed. And they remain in that ditch of religious self-righteousness. What shall we say then, Paul writes, Israel who pursued the law as a way of righteousness has not attained their goal. Now, beloved, listen, if the Jewish people fell into the ditch of religious self-righteousness, then we are not immune to that danger either. Paul warns us that everything that happened to them has been written down for our example. You see, it's true that just like they took the law and misused it, we can take the components of our Christian worship and service and we can use it in a way it was never meant to try to earn God's favor. You know, I see it that there are some believers who their approach to the whole Christian life has a bit of superstition attached to it. You know, I need God to answer my prayer, so maybe if I come to church this week, then he'll answer my prayer. Maybe if I give in the offering this week, he'll bless me. Maybe if I try my best to be good. Maybe if I say the Lord's Prayer and read my devotional book every morning. Maybe if I fast at certain times of the year for certain durations. Or if I do enough good deeds, maybe God will answer my prayer. Beloved, that's not how this whole thing works. You know, as followers of Jesus, those are all things we do. We worship, we give, we pray, we read the word, we fast. And in Matthew 6, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, when you give, give like this. When you pray, pray like this. When you fast, fast like this. He anticipated these are all things that we would do, but we don't do them in order to save ourselves. We do them because we're already saved. We don't do them to earn God's favor. Listen, he's already crazy about you. You don't have to try to earn his pleasure. He's already pleased with you. That's why he sent his son to die on the cross to save you. One of the important truths in these verses is that religious zeal profits a man absolutely nothing if it is not rooted in God's truth. Paul says, I can testify firsthand from my experience as a Pharisee of a Pharisee. I can testify to you that the Jews are zealous about God, but their zeal is without knowledge. They are ignorant of the righteousness that comes from God as a gift. And so they try to establish a righteousness of their own making. You know, when we see people who are zealous for their religion... We tend to admire that. But I want to tell you if that zeal is misinformed, it is altogether unprofitable and ultimately pitiful. Israel pursued, but she didn't attain what she was after. How sad is that? When Paul visited the city of Athens, he wept over how lost they were. The Athenians were very religious. History says that there were more statues of idols in the streets of Athens than people. They even erected an altar to an unknown god, lest they should insult some deity that they didn't know about by failing to worship him or her. Paul said, let me proclaim to you the god that you do not yet know. His name is Jesus. Religious zeal without God's knowledge is not something to admire. It's something to lament because it does the zealous person absolutely no good in the end. It's heartbreaking. I was there in Myanmar at the National Pagoda in Yangon. It's 2,000 years old. It's the size of an Egyptian pyramid in the center of the city. And the top of it is not covered with gold. It's made of solid gold. And it's crusted all over with jewels. And around the central pagoda, there are 1,000 smaller pagodas all covered with gold, each holding a statue of a Buddha. And in front of every one of 
them were worshipers on their knees, making offerings of incense and of gold and of prayers, and how heartbreaking all the time, all the investment, all the sincerity poured out, and in the end, it will profit them nothing. You see, if religion doesn't lead to peace with God and to eternal life, it's an absolutely worthless pursuit. Paul says in these verses, only those who stand on Christ, the cornerstone, will not be ashamed on that great and final day of the Lord. Several years ago, I had a friend who was a landscaper. He came home from work one afternoon, and he and his wife got into a little dust-up in the kitchen. He was aggravated and he wanted to blow off some steam, so he decided to go prune a big tree in their backyard. He went up in the tree and started working away feverishly. Wood chips were flying, sweat was running into his eyes, limbs were falling left and right to the ground, and all of a sudden he fell to the ground. You see, in his frenzied state, he cut the limb that he was sitting on. When he hit the ground, he broke a few bones and he was out of work for a while. Now, someone might have stood back and watched him and admired his zeal, admired how he went after that and attacked that job. But in the end, he was just racing headlong to his own undoing. And so it is with everyone who has religious zeal without God's truth. Sincerity still requires truth. End your striving and begin thriving. Three steps in Romans 9 and 10. Number one, avoid the ditch of religious self-righteousness. Number two, if you want to end your striving and begin thriving, avoid the ditch of non-religious self-righteousness. Paul describes another group on this road race of life. They, too, avoid the stone in the middle of the road, Jesus. They, too, try to steer clear of him at all costs. And in so doing, they steer right into the ditch on the other side of the road, the ditch of non-religious self-righteousness. This describes the Gentile people, the non-Jews without Christ. Paul says the Jews were zealous for God. They wanted to please God. They pursued righteousness. At least they tried. They didn't make it, but at least they tried. Paul said there was something admirable in that, but the Gentiles, they didn't care. They didn't worship God. They didn't submit to him. That's not to say that the non-religious don't care about morality, but they too seek to establish a righteousness of their own making. Paul talks about the non-religious self-righteous in Romans 2. He says they devise a moral law of their own. They're led by their consciences. In the Bible, God calls that being wise in your own eyes. In Isaiah, God says, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Listen to me. When God says, woe, you better say, woe. Solomon says, don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. The way of a fool is wise in his own eyes. Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. There is a way that seems right to a man. But the end of it is destruction. Non-religious self-righteousness is based on comparisons with other people. You know, compared to Hitler, I'm not so bad. Compared to Mother Teresa, maybe not so much. But, you know, I'm pretty much in the middle of the road, and that's good for me. How many people have you heard say, but I'm a good person? You know, to them, the Bible answers, but you haven't done only good. And you, neither have you done all the good you could have. Religious self-righteousness is based on impressing others. It's based on externals, but non-religious self-righteousness is based on self-satisfaction. It is self-selected, self-directed, self-evaluated, and self-congratulatory. It is the pinnacle of human arrogance and defiance against the majesty of God. How many have ever heard someone say, I worship God my own way? Psh, as if God has given any of us that prerogative. Guess what, honey? God hasn't given you permission to worship him your own way. Jesus said there's just one way. 
Sometimes the morality of the non-religious self-righteous is fairly close to God's law. Sometimes it's far away, but it doesn't really matter. Because Paul says in Romans 2, even though their conscience tells them something is wrong, they still do it anyway. The things they judge to be wrong are the very things they do and so condemn themselves. And it is on that basis, Paul says, God will judge them. In the end, those who reject Jesus, those who steer clear of him, who steer around him, Paul says, will be ashamed. He uses those words twice in chapter 9, verse 33, and again in chapter 10, verse 11. It means they'll be ashamed on judgment day, means they'll stand naked before God on judgment day. You know, today the non-religious segment of our society is the largest it's ever been, and it's rapidly growing. Sociologists are following the rise of what they call the nuns, not Catholic nuns, nuns, N-O-N-E-S. People who claim no religious affiliation. When they're asked, what is your religious affiliation? They check the box that says none. In 2007, 16% of American adults said they were no religious affiliation. In 2015, that number rose to 25%. It's doubled in 10 years. The greatest generation who is predominantly religious is dying off and they're being replaced by the millennials who are predominantly non-religious. Still, I have to tell you, I refuse to call them nuns. I'm just calling them not yet. You know why? The Bible says one generation will declare your works to the next and that's exactly what we're going to do in phase two. But here's the thing that you have to realize. The non-religious are just as self-righteous as the religious. Both are trying to establish a righteousness by their own works. The religious self-righteous follow a path that was made by a religious leader or a body of religious writings or teachings. The non-religious self-righteous follow a path of their own devising. But in the end, they are really both just alike. They have both steered clear of the stone in the middle of the road, Jesus, and so have fallen into ditches of self-righteousness. And here's the irony. The religious self-righteous and the non-religious self-righteous have nothing but contempt for one another, even though they're just exactly alike. Here's a tweetable line for today. Non-religious people are just as self-righteous as religious people because both refuse to submit to God's righteousness in Christ. End your striving and begin thriving. Three steps in Romans 9 and 10. Number one, avoid the ditch of religious self-righteousness. Number two, avoid the ditch of non-religious self-righteousness. And finally this, if you want to end your striving and begin thriving, don't steer clear of the rock. Stand on him. Amen. Worship team, you can come help me. Don't steer clear of the rock. Stand on him. Life is a road race, and we are all participants in it. We are all racing to the finish line, the culmination of our earthly existence and the commencement of our eternal existence. And in the middle of the road is a great big stone named Jesus. Those who try to steer around him end up in a ditch of self-righteousness of one kind or another. But there is another alternative. Rather than stumbling on Jesus, rather than steering clear of Jesus, run right to him and stand up on him. There's an alternative to living stuck in a ditch. And that is to receive a righteousness that comes down from God. A righteousness that is readily available and easily accessible. Paul says they looked for it, but they didn't find it. They pursued it with such zeal, but they missed it. How awful is that? How sad is that? He said what they are seeking is not very far out of reach at all. It's not hard to attain. The word of faith that we proclaim, it is all around you. It is near you. It is in your mouth. It is in your heart. 
One doesn't have to climb up to heaven in order to attain this righteousness that comes from God. Jesus came down from heaven in a body of human flesh in order to bring it to us. That's what we're celebrating this Christmas season. I don't have to make my way up to God. He made his way down to me. One doesn't have to plumb the depths of spiritual mysticism in order to acquire this righteousness from God and bring it up. Jesus was crucified and he was laid in a grave, but he raised again and he brought it up with him out into the open. You don't have to strive in order to acquire this righteousness from God. In fact, you cannot acquire it through your own striving. It cannot be obtained by any religion. It cannot be obtained by following your own self-directed path of morality. It's not a righteousness of your own making based on your own efforts. In Romans 5.17, Paul says this righteousness comes down as a gift to us from God. The way we receive it is simply by believing in Jesus. What shall we say? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness, they've attained it. How? By faith in Jesus. You know, that's why I say that today's nuns are really just not yet's. The non-religious people of Paul's day, they weren't even pursuing God, but they heard about Jesus and they believed and they went from being nuns to being all-ins. Many of the people that Jesus reached were the nuns of their day, not interested in religion, but when they heard Jesus, they believed and they became all-ins. And I still believe that there are many not-yets out there who are ready to become all-ins. They just need to hear about Jesus. So how do we receive this gift of righteousness from God? We receive it by believing that Jesus is the one true God. The king of the universe. Jesus is Lord means Jesus is Yahweh. It means Jesus is the God of the Jewish people and the Gentiles. It means Jesus is God of the Old Testament and the New. How do we receive this righteousness from God? By believing in the cross and the resurrection of Christ. The law was never intended to be a means by which anyone could purify himself or lift himself up to God. The law was intended to be a tool of frustration. It was intended to convince people of their own helplessness and their need for an atoning sacrifice. At the end of the law was the bloody sacrifice of a spotless lamb because we cannot stop sinning on our own. The end of the law was a wooden cross on which God himself hung in a body of human flesh and offered his own blood, all of it in payment for our sin guilt. How do we receive this gift of righteousness from God? By submitting to God's prescription for salvation. Beloved, listen to me. God has not given any of us, any of us, permission to pursue our own self-selected, self-directed path of morality. God has given us a prescription for salvation. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, then you shall be saved. Rather than stumbling over Jesus rather than rejecting him, rather than steering clear of him, when we believe on him, God gives us this gift of righteousness from heaven. First, he calls us righteous. Even though we're still sinners, he doesn't regard us as sinners any longer, nor count our sins against us. He calls us righteous, he declares us righteous, and then he sends the gifts of the Holy Spirit to make us what he's called us. The Holy Spirit is a current of life inside of us. We're not good. We're not moral. We don't do good deeds in our own strength. We do them through the current of life that pushes us. And that brings us all the way back to God's word to me on the Snake River and God's word for you today. 
The end of your striving is the beginning of your thriving. The end of your religious self-righteousness is the beginning of enjoying the blessings of God's righteousness. The end of your non-religious self-righteousness is the beginning of enjoying the blessings of God's righteousness. And someone listen to me. There's a word for someone in this house today. I feel there's a word for someone in ministry today. God wants to propel you. God wants to guide you. He wants to carry you on a peaceful, joyful journey. There's some beautiful new scenery ahead for you, the Lord says. And afterwards, He'll receive us into His glory. And it all begins with believing on Jesus. All right, on your way in, you received a little wooden thingy. Now, some of you got excited. Some of you thought I was going to hand out ice cream. I'm sorry. You're not getting ice. Too many Christmas cookies already floating around out there. You ain't getting any ice cream today, all right? No, no, this is supposed to be a paddle. To remind you that it's not your own effort. It's not your striving. You don't have to propel yourself. There's a current of God's life inside of you if you believe on Jesus, and God is going to carry you forward, and God is going to guide you. This is a little paddle to remind you that the end of your striving is the beginning of your thriving. Would you stand on your feet and give Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, a great big praise in this